hey, Bible Night, thank you so much for enjoying this Bible Unbound video. You know, Bible Unbound has a vision to see this kind of gospel-centered biblical content available to everyone for free. Unfortunately, it costs a hefty sum to produce. Fortunately, however, the Lord knew how the world worked, and he's given us a vision to accomplish this task in his word. You see, in Acts chapter 4, the church lacked nothing because they shared everything. And so if you want to get in on this mission of uncovering the gospel in every biblical story, you can go to patreon.com slash Bible Unbound and help support this vision and this mission today. That way, all of our videos will not have AdSense on them. It won't cost money to buy this Bible in a Sentence booklet, and the gospel will be available to everyone for free. Again, you can support this mission at patreon.com slash Bible Unbound. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Though our story begins in roughly 96 AD, we need to take a trip back nearly 1,100 years before this. For John the Visionary, these events were ancient history, much like how you or I might think of the fall of Rome. But for Jesus, the one who is and who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega, these events are past, present, and future. And so we meet Omri, the evil king of Israel. Omri is the father of Ahab, who will marry the wicked woman Jezebel. While there is a mere paragraph given to Omri, king of Israel, in 1 Kings, his influence on world politics and his political prowess should not be underestimated. In fact, while a mere seven verses are dedicated to his name, tomes of his conquest are still being uncovered in Assyrian archaeological digs. You see, Omri posed such a serious political and military threat to the surrounding nations that the world stopped to take notice. But he did not do this because he followed after the way of David. No, Omri was not able to conquer such vast territories because he trusted in the might of his god. Rather, Omri was a political conqueror because of his violent acquisitions of Moab, Tyre, and Samaria. That is why the Bible tells us that King Omri did more evil than all who were before him. Where did he get such a thirst for blood? Why was he considered so evil? The problem lies in the fact that Omri, king of Israel, did not just abandon Yahweh, the God of Israel. Rather, he attempted to forge a new religion, marrying Yahweh to the gods of the surrounding nations. The religion of Omri attempted to worship the pantheon of the Canaanites along with the God of Israel. And these were gods and goddesses of war, might, and ferocity, much like the gods of Assyria much like the gods of Babylon, much like the gods of Rome. Omri succeeded in forging this new religion when he married his oldest son, Ahab, to Jezebel, the son of Ethbaal. It was clear that his religious prowess was not because he wanted to do right and just acts. Instead, like the matrimony of his son to Jezebel, it was entirely political. Omri feared that if he did not wed Israel's god to the gods of the surrounding nations, they would overtake him. And so he did what any cunning political ruler would do. He formed alliances with Israel and the surrounding nations. He would turn on them and then overtake and conquer their people. The only problem is that you cannot create a new religion with Yahweh, the God of Israel, as a side character to a pantheon of other gods like Omri tried to do. This only leads to injustice, immorality, and unrighteousness. In fact, historians and theologians may point to Omri as the reason for the Assyrian exile of the northern kingdom of Israel. From his reign on, Israel will never be the same again. The prostitution to the God of Israel had severed their relationship completely. 
The crossroads of creating a new religion by mixing a pantheon of idols with the one true God is the crossroads we find the early church at in 64 AD when we see Rome burning to the ground. It will continue burning for nearly a week straight. The true cause of this fire will never be known, but it was likely mere political neglect, a lack of proper infrastructure, delegated power, or mere agency to take responsibility. Nevertheless, Nero decides to blame the Christians, a new sect of Jewish Israelites who believed that their long-awaited messianic king had come, lived a perfect life, died on a Roman cross, thus absolving the sins of his followers, come back to life, thus offering true and eternal life to all who would believe in his deity, and finally ascended into heaven, claiming to be the true king of all of creation, the king over every other king. Since these events, Christians had become the easy target for much ridicule. For one, they refused to worship Roman gods, which often included the Caesar himself. They also cared vehemently for the poor, the lame, the brokenhearted, the widow, and the orphan. These types of people were of such a low and useless caste that many thought the Christians were either moronic or highly self-righteous. Finally, these Christians had spent a great deal of their time and energy trying to invite others in on the salvation offered in their messianic king. More people forgiven, meant more people giving their lives to the betterment of the lowly, meant more people abdicating the Roman government, and their gods meant less power for Caesar himself. To top it all off, whenever one of these Christians was killed in a violent, public way, they often made it a point that their death was a gift, a mercy even. And this led to an innumerable number of public conversions as the bravery of the martyrs would ring through time and space through to the hearts of onlookers. Still, despite their deaths being made a sport, they were looked on with disgust. They held no social, no political, no vocational power. They were ridiculed, killed, and despised by everyone who was not convinced of the messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth. This is where we find John the Elder, having been exiled to Patmos because of the anti-Christian sentiment felt throughout the Roman Empire under the rule of Emperor Domitian. This too is why John writes to seven key churches in the revelation that Jesus Christ gives to him. These churches are experiencing severe Roman persecution around 96 AD. John sees a deep need missing in these churches, Many of them have appeared to have lost sight of why they believe what they believe in the midst of this intense struggle. Barclay notes that John seeks to underline the changelessness of God's character to churches who are experiencing nothing but tumultuous lives. Meanwhile, John layers his prophetic book like an onion with allusions to the books that come before it. Making reference to Isaiah chapter 11, John opens his revelation from Jesus Christ with the seven churches unified with and by the sevenfold spirit of God. This important illustration showcases the complete unification of the churches of God with the Holy Spirit of God. The churches are unified with each other and with God through this perfect sevenfold spirit, the Holy Spirit. John makes a new metaphor of the same illusion when he writes of seeing seven lampstands lit by the light of the sevenfold stars. These lights are the spirit of Christ being given to the churches by the word of his mouth, a sharp, two-edged sword. We begin to see that this book says more than meets the eye. So when Christ reveals in verse 19 of chapter 1 that John must write the things that are and that will take place, we know that for the remainder of the book, the contents of Jesus' revelation are things that happen throughout the course of human history until the end of human history. Often, we mistake these events thinking they are only things that will be. Rather, these are events that are and things that will be. 
The following events represent all of us. The human story, the story of Christ, and the story that will culminate human history. Which is why these two phrases will appear over and over again throughout John's letters to the churches. The one who overcomes, and that the person who has an ear should hear. You see, the one who overcomes is meant for John, one who has faith. John views faith in light of the victory of Christ. Therefore, the word overcome could more literally be translated as the one who is victorious. The victorious ones are those chosen by God, his universal church, who have a spirit-empowered faith in Christ himself. This is supported by the one who has an ear and is hearing the Holy Spirit of God. This person is actively responding to the rebukes that the Christ will give to them, and then repenting of their actions as soon as they are met with the conviction of this Holy Spirit. And this is where we find the church of Ephesus. This church was planted by Paul on his second missionary journey in about 52 AD. This church meant a great deal to him, and later he released its care to his protege, Timothy. Paul strongly exhorted Timothy to seek out wise and mature leaders to shepherd the Ephesian congregation through the scriptures and lead them to Christ. Paul even warned the Ephesian church several years before that that false teachers would come into their flock and try to persuade them away from Christ. Therefore, we find the Ephesian church with this strong sense of justice and righteousness. Jesus says to them, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. But I do have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you have hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to this church. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, they are a bold congregation that stands up to false teachers. They fiercely protect their own and have even kicked out leaders whom they perceive to be erroneous. But Christ notes that what they sense in justice, they deeply lack in love, in forgiveness, and in mercy. Jesus rebukes them not just for not loving well, but actually for forsaking the love that they had received in Christ. They have completely abandoned with their whole being the love and the mercy that they had received through Jesus. Ironically, this church reflects closely the churches in Galatia that Paul rebukes for nearly the same thing. But to the one who overcomes this loveless life, the Christ offers a new life in paradise with him, a paradise that John will make more clear by the end of his letter to them. The point the Christ makes is this. Lovelessness is a sign that the church has misunderstood the gospel that they fight so vehemently to preserve. There will always be churches who prioritize God's just wrath over his loving mercy. After generations of this, a church and a Christian like that dissolve into impotence, obscurity, and fruitlessness, and therefore cannot consider themselves a Christ-following church, and Christ will not consider them a Christ-following church. God's justice needs to be held in harmony with his mercy. Smyrna is the next church that Christ focuses on. Smyrna is a city that had been built and destroyed several times, actually. Often historians refer to this as the death and resurrection of Smyrna. After it was destroyed in 580 BC, it laid in ruins until 290 BC, when the Roman Empire rebuilt its ruins into the glory it held when Christ writes to it there. Therefore, Smyrna was a fruitful ally of Rome. The loyalty of Smyrna meant something to Rome, and Smyrna was deeply proud of its tribute to Rome. Therefore, the Roman Empire really built it up as this prominent trade city. 
In return, the city worshipped the Empire with a passion and a vigor. So, when Domitian issued a decree that forced Caesar worship on the grounds of death, well, the town readily agreed. You either worshipped the Emperor, or you died. This is most probably the very tribulation that the Christ is referring to when he writes to this city, saying, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, though you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not. They are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death." Many Christians would have been dragged away and martyred in the name of Domitian's decree. The martyrdom of these Christians led to a severe poverty within the church. They likely, literally, had nothing. Yet Christ says they are rich. Spiritually, they have everything. Worse than their poverty, however, the Christ seems to see that this tribulation is being caused by his very own people, the Israelites, who, like the Romans, hated the Christians, albeit for different reasons. These Israelites seem to have abandoned their worship of Yahweh in favor of worshiping the throne of Rome. Jesus sees this as the epitome of opposition to his kingship and is passionately rebuking this kind of behavior. But Jesus does not rebuke the Smyrna church. Rather, he exhorts them to trust and rest in his providence. To the one who is victorious and does just that, Christ says they will join with him in the new creation outlined at the end of his revelation. The main point of Christ's message to the church in Smyrna is this. The Christians of Smyrna are facing a major inflection point in their history. Worship the state or worship Christ. A dangerous yet present temptation to God's people. Jesus seems to know their hearts intimately enough to know that they are worshiping him. Presumably, this is because it contrasts with the Ephesus and the Pergamum churches, meaning the Christians must be loving, repenting in the assurance of the gospel and rejecting idolatry. However, several miles north of Smyrna, the capital of the Roman province of Asia, Pergamum, is going to receive a message from the cosmic king himself. And he says this to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell. It's where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because there are some of you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put stumbling blocks before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some of you who, in the same way, hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to this church. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. You see, Pergamum made a name for itself during its lifetime of being the most prominent seat of idol worship in the Roman world. Therefore, by association, the city was also the center of the imperial cult, the worship of the state. You see, R.T. France says this, people came from all over the world to be healed by the god Asclepius. Thus, it became the capital of the Asian provinces. But Christ assures this church that his word is infinitely more powerful than the power of the sword of Rome, a likely symbol that would have been seen and worshipped throughout the city. This is what Jesus addresses in referring to Balaam in the food sacrificed to idols, that the Christian church in Pergamum is dangerously close to the edge when it comes to idol worship. Should they continue worshipping the state or the gods of Rome by eating their foods and bowing down at their altars, then God cannot consider this a Christ-centered church. Should that faithful elect be revealed in the church and repent by hearing the words of the sevenfold spirit, well, then Christ promises himself as a strengthening sustenance and a name engraved on a stone. 
And while no one is sure what this white stone is in reference to, it certainly provokes these images of the steadfastness, of an assurance, a promise that is not undone. The main point to Pergamum would be this. Christ exhorts this church for fighting for what is right. Being the most prominent seat of idol worship in the province, the Pergamum Christians are tasked to fight against the cultural practices of idol worship. It often leads to injustice and even idolatry. This seems to be doable for these Christians since they have fought for the name of Christ in other ways, even giving their lives for it. You know, there was another city. It was east of Pergamum, whose church struggled greatly with nearly the same thing. This church was the prominent trade guild city of Thyatira. And while Paul never visited Thyatira, this church was likely planted by one or more likely more of his followers. It's possible that even Lydia was from this prominent city since her name bears the location of Thyatira. She could have moved back here with the help of other Messianic Jewish men and women in the city and planted this very church. The city itself was saturated with idolatry. Rooted deep in this Roman colony was a culture in which trade guilds popped up all around the town. These trade guilds would help members generate business, revenue, and help with imports and exports. It would have been really difficult to make a living in this city without joining one of these guilds, but membership required idol worship. Therefore, the Christ writes this to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. He says this, I know your deeds your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than that at first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over nations. And he shall rule them with an iron rod, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, Jesus addresses the churches in a manner of regality, power, justice, commanding respect for him as a holy and wise king. This king sees the fruits of their labors and commends them for it. He says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. This means that the Holy Spirit is clearly active, moving, growing among them. But unfortunately, however, like Pergamum, some members of the church are tolerating an inappropriate level of idolatry. They worship the state and its political leaders. Therefore, Jesus warns them of the curse of Eden, like he warns the Israelites in Deuteronomy. This idolatry will not lead to life, but will lead to pestilence, to famine, to ruin. It will lead them to becoming Pharaoh. So if there are any Christians among the church in Thyatira, which Jesus seems to think that there are, they will hear this exhortation of the Spirit of God and repent of their ways, or their faith will be proved to be vain, and famine will be their future. The main point of the letter to Thyatira is this. Though the Christians in Thyatira are growing in their faithfulness to Christ, they nonetheless need to identify those in their midst who are actively coercing believers to commit idolatry and repent. Otherwise, it becomes apparent to them and the world that the Holy Spirit is not active in them and they will receive the curse of God. You see, unlike Ephesus, some churches, some Christians, are indeed growing in their lovingness, but they actively tolerate injustices and sin on an inappropriate level. So you can begin to see the purposes of these letters unfolding. The passion that the Christ has toward the churches who worship the state, the government, and its political leaders. But that's not the full story. In order to truly understand the purpose of Christ's firm and loving corrections to his people, we must turn the page to the next three churches. 
for worshipping the government and political powers is only a fruit of a deeper problem. What will the churches of Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea reveal? Let's explore. The city of Sardis was known as the Sleeping City. Built nestled against the large Turkish hills, this city was prominently known for its wealth and impervious location. Approaching battlements either had to cross a long, flat valley and risk being seen all around for hundreds of miles, or attack the city from behind, crossing a dangerous and tall mountain range. The same mountain range that produced valuable minerals for the city. Sardis, you see, was rich from the mineral exports and lazy from never having to worry about attack. Therefore, the citizens of Sardis were overconfident. Did you know twice in its history the city was captured by night? Not because the government didn't have guards set atop the wall that surrounded the city, but because the government felt that those guards were unnecessary and often let them off duty early, or did not station them at all. Sardis was certainly a sleeping city. While historians are uncertain as to how or when the church in Sardis was founded, it seems that the church was no different than the city, asleep and arrogant. And that is why Jesus tells John, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and what is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember, then, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The condemnation to the church is sharp and severe, to be sure. Christ says, be alert, or rather, wake up. The time for self-confidence is over, and the church must strengthen their confidence in God, or they will find that they have had no confidence in him to begin with. But it seems as though, like Alexander that came and attacked the city at night, Christ will also prove their faithlessness quickly, quietly, and all at once, like a thief. Jesus' admonition to them is to begin to actively live out the grace they have received through the gospel, if, indeed, they have received it. They will know they have received it if and when they repent of their over-self-reliance. And that's the main point of Christ's letter to Sardis. It's to actively live into the righteousness and forgiveness that Christ has called you into, if indeed he has called you to it. Through the Holy Spirit, the gospel should provoke us to good works. Sardis, you see, introduces us to the major theme that's present in the last three churches of the letters in the Revelation. The church is likely a symbol of churches or individuals who worship themselves in their comfort over Christ, a deeper root to the problem of the first four churches we've already explored. You see, on the cusp of this very problem, though not quite there yet, was a church in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, was a Grecian city founded for Greek missionaries. They were sent there to proselytize Hellenism for all who would listen and train the next generation of Hellenist missionaries to go out throughout the empire proclaiming the good news of the Greek empire. That is why it became the center of worship for many Greek gods. Chiefly among them was Dionysus, the god of fertility, pleasure, and wine. This was likely because of the many vineyards that surrounded this fertile land. But the church itself didn't seem to be so easily convinced by this strong cultural current, unlike the churches before it. So, you see, that's why Jesus tells John to write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. 
I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Christ commends this church for standing up for what is right, loving well and not falling into idolatry. The church members here have not fallen into state worship or self-worship. The door of the new creation is open to them. The Christ who holds the keys to this door has opened it for them. They can walk through it freely with their heads held high, even though they appear to be the meekest of all the churches. This church in the Brotherly City parallels the church in Smyrna in many key ways. Jesus urges them not to fall into the lies of false teachers and promises them a permanent place in the presence of himself. So then, it also makes a lot of sense why Jesus would appeal to his Trinitarian nature here. You may have missed it, but several times in chapter 3, Jesus refers to God the Father as my God. But then, he also refers to himself as that same God. While it may not be possible for me to say exactly why this is the case, I can do my best. And my best would be to point out that the Trinity is an appeal to community, as is receiving a name from God in the Bible. You see, while both are no less than facts, they are also images of a deep and abiding sense of community with and in the triune Godhead. Community in the Bible is radically important because it leads to justice, accountability, and perhaps most importantly here, selflessness. John is likely reflecting the theme of selflessness throughout his letters. This would also be why John then cuts to a completely different kind of church, several miles to the south, the final church of Laodicea. They may represent the culmination of all the churches that came before them. A church that has nearly abandoned the worship of Christ for the worship of Rome and placed themselves as the center of prime reality. You see, Laodicea was one of the richest commercial centers in the world at the time of Revelation. It may do us well that we take Laodicea as a picture of the affluent church. The church who, like Sardis, has become so comfortable with their lives, they have become like Pergamum, the center of idol worship, and they may be entirely aware of it and yet apathetic to it. The church in Laodicea, like Ephesus, seems to have grown indifferent to goodness and to love, but unlike Ephesus, indifferent also to justice and truth. They had grown seemingly unaware of their forgiveness entirely. Leon Morris, you see, in his commentary says, this church receives the severest condemnation of all the seven to whom letters are sent because of their lack of spiritual awareness. It's also the first time that Christ does not draw his title directly from chapter one of the Revelation, but rather he feels the need to assert himself in a way to reflect faithfulness and fidelity. Well, this would stand in stark contrast to the unfaithfulness of the Christians in Laodicea. Christ says this, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, 
not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Ironically, you see, the church in Laodicea sat between two springs. A hot spring ran from Hierapolis to the north southward through Laodicea. This hot spring ran through mountain valleys and mixed with cold mountain runoff until it bubbled up again in Colossae, where the spring water was cool and refreshing. The problem is that between the two springs sat Laodicea. By the time either water made its way into this town, it had become lukewarm. Morris goes on to say that outright denial of Jesus is better than phony piety. To prefer a rejection of faith to the way the Laodiceans professed it is startling, to say the least, but to profess Christianity while remaining untouched by its fire is a disaster. There is more hope for the openly antagonistic than for the coolly indifferent. There is no one farther from the truth in Christ than the one who makes an idle profession without real faith. Their coolness was a denial of all that Christ stands for. Worse yet, this apathy seems to have stemmed from their self-reliance, their richness. By now, the Christ writes to this church and it seems that not a Christian remains there. Jesus stands and pounds on the door, but no one has yet to answer him. If the elect are revealed at this church, meaning if there are repentant Christians here, then Christ promises the highest honor of sitting with him in the new creation, having victory over the world. The point is clear. The church in Laodicea is a church who has abandoned Christ in everything but name. They are akin to the Jews who profess their Judaism, yet form a synagogue of Satan. Yet, if at this rebuke, if the Holy Spirit is within some, then Christ will give them a high place of honor. But if not, then, like the church in Ephesus, Christ would no longer consider this place a Christ-following church. They themselves would likely not consider themselves Christians at all. They have no need for Christ or his forgiveness. Why continue on? In Bruce Longnecker's historical fiction, the Lost Letters of Pergamum, we get a glimpse into what the revelation of Jesus Christ is hitting at. In Longnecker's book, there is a fictional church in Pergamum, and they are met with a choice in the face of Roman persecution. This church can either stop worshiping Jesus in a house, or they can begin to take communion in the temple of Asclepius during the meal festival. What harm could it be? It seems like a simple enough choice, they think. And so the church begins to meet in the temple of Asclepius, when not one year later, we find this same church having abandoned Christ entirely. What happened, we're led to ask. Especially since this abandonment has led to several injustices in their congregation. They no longer care about the poor, they've kicked out the widows and the bondservants among them. They actually don't let anyone from a different social class meet with them at all. In fact, what we hear one member saying later is that, you know, Jesus is okay, but by sacrificing to Dionysus, it led to a good harvest. What we see is that this church thinks that Jesus is just another god among a pantheon of gods. More so, the Roman pantheon was not keen on orphans or widows. In fact, the Roman pantheon paraded strength, war, self-advancement. These are all virtues that Jesus deems as vices. The question that the book wants us to consider is whether or not this church ever believed that Jesus was king of the universe, the one true god incarnate among men, who died for their sins and rose to bring them new life. It would seem not. 
After all, if they truly understood the depths of that kind of love, why would they forsake justice for selfish gain? That was not the way of Christ, especially since most of the Christians around the Roman Empire were dying for their faith. You know, it's a helpful way to look at the letters to the churches in the Revelation. It's even a helpful way to examine our own lives. If we are forsaking Jesus' gospel message of the complete remission of sins and adding or taking from that message, we may not understand the gospel. We may be at a crossroads, like Omri or the early church, verging on deluding ourselves into creating a false religion since the thought of Christ's kingship, the thought of Christ as God, is too unbearable. However, at this crossroads, the book of Revelation reveals, Christ is there, calling us back to himself. And the faithful hear this call and they turn, not because they are any better than the people around them, but because Jesus Christ is living and active among them in the Holy Spirit. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time. Music